We want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful, beautiful day. Uh, teachers, if you're watching, if you're not signed up, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash six dash eight registration. Sign up for us, please, so we'll have a record of your attendance. Uh, the program today is Organisms in Their Environment, Part One. During this virtual field trip, students will observe how different environments support different varieties of organisms and describe how biodiversity contributes to the sustainability of an ecosystem. Mr. Monroe will do microhabitats part one. Mr. Dominguez will do microhabitats part two. Ms. Ramirez will tell you about the tundra, tiger, and the grasslands. And Ms. Ram, deciduous forest, rainforest, and deserts. Students, you cannot ask us a verbal question during this program, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash questions space answer and fill out a question and send it to us. And we will be glad to answer it for you. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Mr. Monroe is going to tell you all about microhabitats. Hello everyone. My name is Mr. Monroe and we're going to be looking in to what we call microhabitats. And I know you guys know what that word habitat means. It means an animal's home. And for it to be considered an animal's home or a place where the animal lives, there's the basic needs of that animal has to be found in that habitat. And there are food, water, shelter, and space. And you know what, guys? Microhabitat, oh, you might, under, might get an understanding that it might mean a smaller habitat. And hopefully by the end of my presentation, you guys will know what a microhabitat is and be able to give at least three examples of microhabitats that can be found locally. And there's another one that I want you to kind of understand too. And that is the term mini beast. And at the very end of my presentation, I'm gonna get a live mini beast out to show you. So bear with me while I share my screen and we get started. Microhabitats, habitats in the local environment. You know, a habitat is a place that an animal, uh, where an animal lives. It provides the animal with food, water, and shelter, and space if they need it. There are many different sorts of habitats around the world, from forests to grasslands, and from mountain slopes to deserts. Different habitats are home to different animals. They live well together, because they all do things to help the whole habitat be healthy. A microhabitat is a very small specialized habitat, such as a clump of grass or a space between rocks, meaning that it can be very small. It is a habitat for extremely small creatures, such as wood lice. A small part of a habitat is a microhabitat. Microhabitat has its own conditions of temperature and light and its own characteristic species. Microhabitats include the shady area under a tree and the underside of a rock in a stream. It can be very small. You know, a fallen log. This is a microhabitat. It is dark and warm inside. Many beasts live there because they can eat the rotting wood, keep moist in the dark inside, and burrow out of the sun. They are safe from birds that want to eat them. So that's an excellent habitat for these many beasts. Leaf litter, that can be another microhabitat. This microhabitat is a home to uh, animals that like to be warm, damp, and in the dark. The animals can nest to, or hide to protect themselves. And creatures that are found there, you can see the images there. A millipede, a, a peel bug, or a, uh, <clears throat> I'll call them roly-polies, a snail, a worm, and so on. And then another example of a microhabitat would be a rock pool. 
the microhabitat of a rock pool can change as the tide comes in and out and washes water and life in and out also. Some rock pools are full of life, whilst others at the back of the beach that do not get refreshed by the tide have less life. A clump of grass is another example of a microhabitat. A clump of grass is a microhabitat. It is home to many, many bees who eat the grass, sh shelter in the clump, and can be camouflaged in the leaves to protect them from predators. And we see uh, images of those organisms that would probably be found in a clump of grass. Grasshoppers, ants, ladybugs, uh, beetles, uh, caterpillars, and worms, and spiders. Many different mini bees live in many different microhabitats. They're all suited to live in that particular microhabitat habitat because they can find food, water, and shelter they need. Many bees help to keep the microhabitat healthy. Caterpillars is another example of a mini bee. Caterpillars like to live on top and underneath leaves. This is so they can use their camouflage and blend into the leaf. This helps protect them so that they cannot be seen by predators that would consume them. The caterpillars can then also catch what they want to eat. An ant. Ants mostly live underground. They live in big families. There are a lot of insects to eat underground. Ants do not have, or they don't have ears. Ants hear by feeling vibrations in the ground through their feet. Isn't that something? Another example of a mini beast is the worm. Worms like to live anywhere there is soil. They like to eat dead leaf matter and need the soil to be moist. Worms help keep soil healthy as they dig tunnels that they let air and water into the soil and to the roots of plants that are growing in that area. And then we have spiders as a mini beast. Spiders are able to live just about anywhere. They do well in all types of habitats, but they do have to find shelter when the weather gets colder. Their body colors help them blend in well to their surroundings. Spiders build webs to catch small insects to eat. And then we have ladybugs. During the summer, ladybugs live in shrubs, branches, and flowers. When the weather gets cold, colder, they find protective hiding places, such as a tree stump, cracks in the wood. This then becomes a place to hibernate at the base of the tree or even under a rock. They crawl under leaves to protect themselves from the winter cold. When hibernating, ladybugs huddle together in order to keep warm. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen right there because I've about run out of time. And I've got my favorite mini beast that I want to show you. This is one that I've been interested in years because I found out that they're amazing insects. It is called a best beetle. And I first heard about him when I was a very young person. I heard my mother refer to somebody being as crazy as a Betsy bug. And I really didn't know whether there was an actual bug called a Betsy bug until I started studying science later on. The Betsy bug is another name for a best beetle. They act as decomposers in the environment in which they're living. They love to live in a microhabitat that ordinarily would be a dead log or dead tree in the forest. Most of the time they prefer oak wood and they live in family groups. That's what's amazing. You know, insects usually when they, their eggs hatch, they just go their way. But these guys live in family groups in one log and they communicate with one another. And they also co-parent their young. They are amazing simply because these guys can move over 20 times their own body mass. Here I have this amazing mini, be mini beast called a best beetle. They look quite threatening, but
but they are not threatening. They have very large mandibles. That's a body structure that they use to chew the wood that they're helping to break down so it can be recycled. And they love oak wood. You can see they crawl around very, very slow. That's a best beetle. That's also called a Betsy bug. And it's also called a patent leather beetle. And it is an example, another example of a mini beast. Okay, I've run out of time. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. If any of you have any questions, I bet he can answer those for you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. And the question came in, describe a habitat, a microhabitat. Microhabitats are the small scale physical requirements of a particular organism or a community of organisms. For example, a decomposing log like Mr. Monroe showed you in a forest supports a distinct population of decomposers, plants and invertebrates, but the forest houses the big log itself. So that is a micro habitat. And now thank you. And Mr. Dominguez is gonna tell you about microhabitats part two. Hey guys, I had a question for you. When you think of the word habitat, what do you think of? You may think of a place like this, a place where animals live. So oceans, rivers, ponds, lakes, forests, jungles, and maybe even the post oak preserve. This place is right across the street from us and it's home to plenty of animals like deer, rabbit, raccoons, weasels. So there's a ton of life in this place. However, there are smaller habitats within the larger habitat called microhabitats that may not share the same characteristics as the broader habitat around us. So if we look closely underneath this log, we might be able to see small creatures. And if we look closely, you'll see that we do have some termites. So do you guys see those little white bugs? Those are termites. We definitely don't want those in our home. If we look a little bit to our left, we see snails and an ant. So this is a microhabitat. And today we are going to make a microhabitat of our own. All right, guys, we are going to make a microhabitat for isopods, more commonly known as roly polies today. But in order for us to make a good microhabitat for these very small creatures, we need to keep a couple of things in mind. They are decomposers. That means that the primary food source for these little bugs is going to be decaying organic matter. So things like dead leaves, decaying wood. They are crustaceans. That means that they have gills and require a pretty humid, moist environment to survive. They are not insects like most people think they are. So with those two things in mind, these are the things that you will need. You will need a shoebox sized Sterilite plastic container, some water, some sphagnum moss, and you can get this at a garden store, some fish food, some fish flakes, some almost bad vegetable. I have some squash that, uh, that I was about to throw out some oyster shell or any other source of calcium for their exoskeleton. Now, oyster shell is pretty cheap and you can get this at a feed store uh, or you can use some dried eggshell. You will need something for them to hide under. This will be their shelter. Uh, this will keep them pretty dark and will hold in humidity. Some gloves to work with. Now, this is the most important part, uh, their soil. And this is actually a pre-made soil mixture that has decayed uh, wood and some dead leaves um, already mixed into it. Now you can collect this, um, these things outside. However, if you do sanitize it by freezing it, uh, that will kill off any unwanted uh, 
bugs like termites or mites that you don't want coming into your home or classroom, okay? So you will need soil and I do recommend uh, getting it from a hardware store, but just make sure it's organic, pesticide free, chemical free. That way you don't kill any of your isopods. The dead leaves and the decayed wood you can get uh, outside, but just make sure that those things are uh, sanitized by freezing them. And of course you will need isopods, which you can order from our Living Material Center. You can order them online. I strongly discourage you from collecting them outside because collecting any wild animal, uh, any organism uh, from nature is taking away a link from a food chain. Uh, and you don't want that because it does affect other organisms. Um, so you are taking an organism that plays a role in the environment. And uh, at the Environmental Center, we definitely don't want that. Uh, so guys, let's get started. Let's start building our microhabitat. All right, guys, I've added my soil, decayed leaves, decayed wood to my sterilized container. So I've added just enough for a depth of around three inches uh, because isopods have a tendency to burrow uh, when they are uh, very young. And if you have young isopods, you definitely want enough soil for them to burrow into. All right, guys, next I am going to add water to half of the soil so i'm going to saturate half of this soil half of this side with water so i want a humidity gradient so i want the isopods to be able to move back and forth in their microhabitat and choose how much moisture that they need so i'm going to pour some water into this half of the container uh, and using my hand, I'm just going to mix it in like this to, just to make sure that uh, the water saturates all the way down to the bottom. After adding the water to this side, I also added some rehydrated uh, sphagnum moss uh, to this end of the microhabitat because it's a lot easier to keep this uh, moisture gradient if you have something like sphagnum moss that holds in moisture pretty well for a very long time. So this is an optional thing that you can uh, add to your microhabitat, but um, it's well worth it because you won't have to spray down your enclosure um, as often uh, without it. You can now sprinkle your source of calcium so remember, I used oyster shell, but you can use uh, dried egg shell. That would uh, work just fine. Or cuddle bone if you can find it. Uh, remember, I had some old vegetables, some squash. So I'm going to add some squash to this microhabitat. And remember, this is not their primary food source, but this is additional uh, nutrition for your uh, ISO buddies and I'm also going to add a little bit of protein in the form of fish food. Alright guys this is my favorite part adding your roly-polies. So like I said you can order them from the Living Material Center here at the EEC or get them online. Try not to uh, get them from outside. You don't want to disturb any food chain. So check these guys out. These are pretty cool roly polies. So let's add them and let's leave them alone. Let's let them hang out and get used to their new habitat. All right, guys, I closed up my microhabitat. Make sure that you have a lid on your container. You don't want to lose any of that humidity. 
Uh, however, you also don't want this container to be airtight. You do want some airflow. Uh, if you start to notice a lot of water droplets uh, accumulating either on the sides or up top, uh, you can drill a hole to uh, better that airflow. As far as maintenance goes, you will only need to feed these guys every other week. Um, and they will eventually, uh, if you did everything correctly, uh, start to breed for you. They will start having little isopod babies. Uh, and when that happens, if your colony gets big enough, you can make another microhabitat. So guys, I hope you enjoyed making this uh, very small world with me. Uh, I will see you guys next time. Thank you, Mr. Dominguez. And the question, uh, give an example of a microhabitat and uh, the decomposing log in a forest supports a distinct population of decomposers, plants and invertebrates, but the forest houses the log itself. Thank you again. And now Mr. Maris is going to tell us about tundra, tiger, and uh, grasslands. Couldn't, couldn't read my own writing there for a minute. Hello, my name is Ramirez. And in this segment, we're going to be learning. Oh, one second. I think I might need to help my coworker turn his volume off. Otherwise, you'll hear me speaking twice. <laughs> so, one second. <laughs> okay, I am back and hopefully you only hear one of me now. Um, so we're going to be learning about three different types of biomes today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys and we'll get started. So let me start that screen share. And let me pull up our slide presentation. We got a lot of things pulling up right now. So I have a couple of essential questions for you guys. Hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first is compare and contrast the tundra biome and the taiga biome. And the second is what percent of the Blackland Prairie ecosystem is left in Texas and why is that? So keep those two questions in mind as we go through the presentation. Now I'm gonna go ahead and stop our PowerPoint slide and I have a little video a presentation that I'm gonna show y'all. So let me pull that back up. And it's gonna be all about the biomes. Our first biome is going to be the tundra. This biome is located in the Arctic and high mountain region. It's characterized by low average temperatures. Typically during the summer, max temperatures will reach around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And in some regions, the summer temperatures won't even get above freezing, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Winters are typically dark, cold, and windy, and the tundra experiences very little precipitation. The tundra is characterized also by permafrost, which is a permanent frozen layer, and it usually lies below an active layer of soil. Plants found in the tundra include lichen, mosses, and woody shrubs. These plants have shallow roots since they cannot grow in the permafrost. So these plants have been well adapted to survive in the colder environment of the tundra. And you can see some of those beautiful examples of wildflowers. Also notice that the tundra doesn't really have a lot of trees. It's very sparse with those trees. And you can see some of those pretty lichen. Animals in the tundra include things like polar bears, wolves, and musk oxen. Now animals like the musk oxen, they have thick fur and fat deposits that protect them from the cold. And then some animals such as caribou will actually migrate. And then you can see our cute little fox there. So these animals are adapted to those cold environments. Now our next biome is the taiga. The taiga is also called the boreal forest. And taiga comes from the Russian word 
that means land of little sticks. And if you look at those trees, they do look like sticks. Now here in North America, we refer to the taiga as a boreal forest. And there's actually two types of taiga. There's an evergreen taiga, which you see here in the dark blue. And there's a seasonal taiga, also called a larch, which you see here in the light blue. The seasonal taiga is mostly found in Siberia, while the evergreen taiga that we're gonna mostly focus on are found in Canada, Northern Europe, and Asia. This region is characterized by low average temperatures, similar to the tundra, but just a little bit warmer. It's also characterized by a little more precipitation than what is found in the tundra. And you can also see all those coniferous trees. So the dominant plant type in the taiga are conifers. And conifers are simply trees that are evergreen, meaning they have needle-like leaves. They get the name evergreen because they are forever green, no matter what the season. Uh, but those needle-like leaves help those trees conserve energy and water, and they're able to produce food all year long. And you can see some examples of those conifers. Now, we even have conifers here in Texas, most notably the pine trees and cedars. Now the soil layer in the taiga is very thin, acidic, and nutrient poor. It also has permafrost in some areas. Remember the tundra also had permafrost. Now the reason the soil is not very good is because since the soil is acidic, there's not a lot of invertebrates like decomposers such as earthworms and invertebrates that are able to break down all those dead leaves or those dead needles. And so there's a thick blanket or a thick layer of all that dead needle and leaves. And that blanket kind of insulates the ground and it makes it rather cold. Hence, it promotes the permafrost. And again, permafrost is just that layer of ice that's underneath the soil. Because of the permafrost, that layer acts as a barrier to water and prevents drainage. So in the taiga, we often see things like bogs and swamps include wolves, owls, elk, all of those can be year round and mosquitoes. Remember there's bogs and swamps there. Now our next biome is the grassland. There are two main types of grasslands. There's a temperate and a tropical grassland. Tropical grasslands are in environments near the equator. They typically are warm all year round and have rainy and dry season. Now for this segment, we're mostly going to focus on the temperate grasslands because that's what we have here in North America. Now in North America, we typically refer to our grasslands as a prairie, but around the world, different countries and regions have different names. Now the North American prairie has moderate precipitation. It's also characterized by hot summers and cold winters. So that sort of sounds familiar if you're from Texas. And it has grasses as a dominant plant type. So typically in a prairie, we'll see things like little blue stem, Indian grass, cytocamma, and lots of beautiful wildflowers. Now notice these grassland plants have deeper roots. Those deeper roots allow these grasses to find available moisture that is deeper underground and also helps them to regrow after fire. If you ever visit the environmental center, especially during the springtime, you might be lucky to see blue bonnets and a lot of our beautiful wildflowers. Some common animals that are found in the temperate grasslands include things like bison, antelope, prairie dogs, and coyotes. Since we live in Texas, we're gonna focus on the Blackland Prairie Eco Region, which is where our center is located. And the Texas Blackland Prairie has some of the richest soil with various grasses. Now today, this region has been used extensively for farming or agriculture. And that is because the soil in this region is super rich in nutrients. Because this land is so fertile, only 5,000 of the original 12 million acres remains in true prairie condition. So that is less than 1% of Texas Blackland Prairie remains. And that is because most of 
the Texas Blackland Prairie has been destroyed and repurposed for urbanization, for farming, and to accommodate growing cities. So think about what the impacts of urbanization and farming and agriculture have on the Blackland Prairie. Now, what you're seeing here is some video from here at the Environmental Center, and you're able to see some of our prairie remnants. Now, notice all those tall grasses. We also have some trees that are mixed in there as well. Common trees that can be found in this area include things like cottonwood, pecan, uh, post oak. We also actually have quite a few evergreens like those cedars. Now, something interesting about the grassland or the prairie is fires. And fires are actually a good thing for grassland prairie. So periodic fires help to prevent trees from overgrowing. So these fires help to burn the dead plant material and kills trees and shrubs, leaving behind the typical grasses that we see. And the grassland plants, well, they're adapted to fire. So some plants regrow from their roots after a fire, while others actually need a fire so that their seeds can germinate. Now, because prescribed burning is not really common in our area anymore, we're starting to get a lot of tree growth and it's starting to overtake those native grasses. We also use a lot of our prairie area for livestock. So here you see uh, some of our cattle. We have CV the Longhorn, and then we have uh, one of our Angus cows, and we have another cow over here. She's an Angus and a Holstein mix. But this grassland is important grazing pasture for our cattle that we have. Just to review, the taiga, also known as the boreal forest, has low average temperatures. It's slightly warmer than the tundra, has more precipitation than the tundra, and the most dominant plants are the conifers. Animals that can be found there include migratory birds, owls, elks, and wolves. Now the tundra is a super cold biome, has very low average temps, very little precipitation, is marked by permafrost. Common plants include mosses and woody shrubs. Trees are very sparse in the tundra. Animals include things like musk oxen, caribou, and ground squirrels. Now both the taiga and the tundra also have that permafrost. Then we talked about the grassland. An example would be the North American prairie. It's marked by moderate precipitation, hot summers, cold winters, deep soils that are rich in nutrients and perfect for farming. Grasses are the dominant plant and animals that can be found here include bison, antelope, prairie dogs, and coyotes. My challenge for you guys is to visit the Post Oak Preserve, which is located in Seagoville, Texas, and observe uh, the Post Oak Savannah and the Blackland Prairie. And that's all I have for you guys today. We're going to give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Maris. And a student wants us to describe the taiga, generally referred to in North America as the boreal forest or snow forest. It is a biome characterized by coniferous forests consisting mostly of pines, spruces, and larches. Now, I want you to look up, it's like I'm going to, the tree larches. I have never heard of that before. Thank you. And now, Ms. Ram is going to tell you about deciduous forest, rainforest, and deserts. Hey everybody, it's me, Ms. Shram, and we are talking all about the rest of these biomes. So let me get this little screen going. It's gonna take 300 years to load. And we're good. Okay, so at the end of my part of the field trip, you'll be able to observe and describe how different environments support different varieties of organisms. And like you heard, we are gonna focus on deciduous forests, rainforests, and deserts. Okay, so our essential questions today are, 
How are the deciduous forest biome and rainforest biome alike and different? So we've got deciduous forest, rainforest, and then also how are the tundra that you learned about with Ms. Ramirez and the desert biomes alike and different? So first let's talk about, let's see why is it not going? Okay, deciduous forest. So deciduous forest is when you picture going into the woods, that is your typical deciduous forest. Um, mostly conifers, like you learned about with Ms. Ramirez, um, and deciduous forests are known for their four distinct seasons. So we're going to have winter, fall, summer, and spring. And because we have those four seasons, you're going to see, yes, a lot of evergreens, but you're also going to see a lot of um, color changes throughout the seasons. So not all plants are going to lose their leaves. Those um, pine-like trees or the, the trees with pine-like needles, the conifers, they're going to keep their um, needles or some of them may drop some, but there are evergreens. And then there are also um, bigger leaf plants like uh, maple trees, oak trees, things like that, that are going to drop their leaves in the winter. So just like now you look out, it's looking grim. <laughs> There's no leaves on the trees. Um, that is what a deciduous forest is going to experience. So what happens when all those leaves change color and the beautiful show is over? Well, those leaves land on the soil and are broken down by um, decomposers. And that um, those nutrients that were in the tree are now returned into the soil. So deciduous forests have um, really rich and fertile soil, um, rich meaning it is um, rich in nutrients from all those decomposing leaves. So there's a constant flow of trees falling, or sorry, leaves falling down, breaking down and becoming part of the soil again. And then the seasons continue and continue and continue. So there's always um, a lot of nutrient rich soil. So they're also known for the um, abundant amount of moisture um, and deciduous forests receive about 30 to 60 inches of precipitation per year. And I say precipitation because it's not always just rain. Of course, um, different parts of the country are gonna receive snow and sleet and um, hail and things like that as well. So 30 to 60 inches of precipitation per year. So there are layers in the deciduous forest. The top is the canopy. So that's gonna be the tallest, the tallest of the trees. Then there's the understory, um, the lower layers of the trees. Um, and maybe some young saplings are gonna be there too. Then there's the shrubbery layer. And then of course the forest floor, which we talked about with all those leaves. So you're gonna see leaves and ferns and things like that. Um, so kind of the pictures of the back, that's um, something that the forest floor would look like with newly fallen leaves and already decomposing leaves. And also there's a lot of lichen and moss that grows in deciduous forest and a lot of fungi as well. So because there are so many layers, not a lot of light reaches the bottom of the forest floor. Uh, so things that don't require too much light, like lichens and moss and fungi and things like that are able to grow because of the abundant amount of moisture and they don't get too much sunlight. So coniferous, coniferous forest animals. I don't know why everything's a tongue twister for me this afternoon, um, but these are some kind of examples that you would see in the forest. We've got bears and uh, bison and voles and snakes and frogs, deer porcupines, owls, all these sorts of things. So these are all your forest animals. All right, so the rainforest. Uh, the rainforest, unlike deciduous forests, does not have four seasons. It is consistent climate, consistent temperature, and it's really, I guess, technically just one season. So there's no seasonal changes. Um, the rainforest also, because it does not have those four seasons, um, it has really poor soil. So even though there are all those leaves that are also falling and dying, um, they're really um, subjected to a lot of weathering because of how much rain they get. So the nutrients are often washed out and the soil to begin with is more acidic, like you learned about with Ms. Ramirez and other biomes. And so 
the leaves never really, um, the nutrients from the leaves never really break down. The nutrients are really in the living plants themselves. So um, rainforests are hot and humid because of all the rainfall. The air is going to be really, really humid and it's also in tropical areas. So it's also hot. So it's much different than our deciduous forests already. So rainforests get up to 394 inches of rain per year on average. So that is a lot, lot, lot more rain. Um, I believe we said deciduous was between 30 and 60 inches. So that is significantly more. And like I said, all those plants, um, the leaves and the plant matter at the bottom get kind of washed out of their nutrients because of all that intensive weathering. There are also layers to the rainforest, just like the deciduous forest. So we've got the emergent layer, which is on the top, and the canopy, canopy layer, which is next, the understory slash shrub layer, and then the forest floor. So you can see some of those things changed because the plants are much, much different. So on the right, you can see some examples of plants that would grow in the rainforest. Um, the top, uh, I would recommend researching um, is a corpse flower. And it's a really, really, really stinky, huge flower. Um, you should look it up for some more information. But there's a lot of carnivorous plants in the rainforest. They have to get creative because that soil is so um, poor in nutrients. A lot of plants have adapted to get nutrients from other means, like being carnivorous plants or eating small insects and things like that. So um, rainforest plants are probably, I. I think the most interesting, just because they've had to adapt um, to those extreme conditions. Um, and then of course, here is one of my favorite plants, um, the Monstera, also sometimes known as a Swiss cheese plant. Um, a lot of house plants that we get and that are really popular right now. Um, and you can find them at your Lowe's in the garden section. A lot of house plants uh, are actually from rainforests or tropical areas. So some of these you may see in your own home. So, and of course, here's our rainforest animals. I won't go over all of them, but of course the rainforest is known for having a wide um, array of different kinds of animals, different species, huge variety, um, so many different species and different adaptations and bright and beautiful, um, colorful animals. So I'm not gonna go over them too much, but there they are. And then we have our desert biome. So um, there's actually four different types of deserts. I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but just briefly, um, there are hot and dry deserts. Uh, those are known as arid deserts. There are semi-arid deserts. So it's kind of like hot and dry deserts, but not as extreme. There's coastal deserts. Of course, those are a little less extreme because they're by the coast. So they might have a little more humidity. Um, and then there are cold deserts as well. So the main thing when you think of deserts um, is hot and dry deserts or arid deserts. And these deserts have harsh temperature fluctuations. It makes it hard for plants and animals to live there or humans to um, visit for extended periods of time because there is very, very little humidity. Um, and so the temperatures go really, really high during the day and really, really low at night. So you don't really think of the desert as being cool, but at nighttime, the desert can get very, very cold. Um, and deserts typically get 10 inches of rain per year. So that is much different than what we've talked about before. So desert plants have had to adapt just like rainforest plants have. Um, they've adapted to retain as much water as possible. And of course, there is not the layers like we have in um, forests. So a lot of them, don't need to have as big of leaves because they don't need to catch as much um, sunlight. So in the rainforest, you're gonna see large leaves because it has to compete with all the other plants to try and get as much sunlight as possible because that's where it gets its food and its energy. But in the desert, um, you don't need as much sun because you're getting so much, your leaves don't have to be as large, right? So they have tiny leaves or um, little like cactus, like the little prickers, those are their leaves. So I'll show you a couple examples in a second. And then of course we have our desert lion, or sorry, desert lions, <laughs> desert animals, dear goodness. Um, so you could see the different adaptations there. All right. 
I'm gonna stop sharing and show you some different plants I have in my room. Okay, so we'll start with desert since we just talked about that one. And so here is of course, one of my little cacti. And like I said, um, in the desert, you're gonna get so much sun that your leaves don't have to be as large. So all those little needles are actually the leaves on the cactus. And they have little tiny pores, hopefully you can see. So they have those little tiny pores that the spikes are coming out of. And those are small and they're closed to retain as much water as possible. All right, so I also have some prickly pear, which you may see outside. I've been propagating or reproducing these um, from my big pile of prickly pear outside my classroom. And then I have this barrel cactus. I love this one, but I will not touch it because it hurts horribly. But yeah, you can see this one has tons of those needles, tons of um, those little leaves. Sorry, you can hear my baby goat crying in the background. He must have escaped the barn again. Hopefully you get to come out and see him soon. Okay, so then I have um, some plants from deciduous forest. So this is a fern and this one, it's not a conifer, but it does have kind of those needle-like leaves. Um, much different than those cactus, obviously. So a lot of ferns are from uh, deciduous forests and well, rainforest as well. Then they grow on the bottom layers. So let's see, I also got my little conifer here. Whoa. And you can see, I'm trying to bend it to the cameras, but without breaking it. So we've got all those needle-like leaves right here. They're much softer. This one, is evergreen, it never changes. Okay, and then this one, this leaf is from my elephant ear plant. Um, this is a tropical plant. This is actually really small, but one of the barn kittens that's living in my room uh, decided to dig in the plant. So this little leaf fell off. But if there were, this were able to grow, and um, different other varieties of elephant ear get really, 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 really big. And sometimes you can even grow them here in Texas, even though they're not native. But these are more native to rainforest and tropical climates. Last one, because I'm already out of time, but this is my favorite, that monstera I was telling you about. I have a huge monstera here in my classroom. And you can see it's called the Swiss cheese plant. And it's got those huge broad leaves to try and catch as much sunlight as it possibly can. All right, so that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for joining us and I can't wait to see you in person. Thank you, Ms. Ram. A student would like for you to describe the rainforest. It's a luxuriant forest generally composed of tall broad leaf trees and usually found in wet tropical uplands and lowlands around the equator. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to share my screen. During this field trip, students observe how different environments support different varieties of organisms and describe how biodiversity contributes to the sustainability of an ecosystem. Mr. Munro and Mr. Dominguez did microhabitats. Ms. Ramirez talked about tundra taiga in grasslands. And Ms. Ram just got to tell you about deciduous forest, rainforest, and the desert. Thank you, teachers, for joining us and students. If you would, teachers, go to www.tiny.cc slash six dash eight feedback, fill out a short form and send it back to us. We would appreciate it. You guys have a great rest of this beautiful day. And also, I hope you have a great rest of your life.